coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. Andrew, you know, submitted them on a different hook. And I was like, instead of just making it a smaller hippie stopper, let's call it the mini hippie stopper and tie it on this different hook. And it's just killed. That's the kind of stuff, you know, it's great when a fly comes together like that. You introduce it as a new fly on a hook that's really custom built for that application. We're giving the angler a better product and a better day on the water. That was Brent Bauer with the evolution of the Hippie Stomper, Umpqua's top dries, nymphs, streamers, and terrestrial patterns today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thank you for stopping by the show. A quick and easy way to support this podcast is to click over to our sponsors' websites and check out some of the great products they have going on. Uh, you can do that at any time, and want to thank you in advance if you had a chance to purchase a product from one of our sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by Stonefly Nets, who is putting quality before quantity with their handcrafted custom wood landing nets. When Ethan designs your net, it's his hope and goal to help you form lasting memories every time you're on the water. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly right now to get started. That's S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to Stonefly online. Today's episode is sponsored by Maverick Fly Fishing. They make the lightest Euro nymphing reel in the world, which makes your rod more sensitive, casting more accurate, and you can hold your dead drifts longer without shoulder burn. Check out Maverick Fly Fishing Stinger and their other Euro nymph products and support this podcast by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash maverick right now. That's maverick, M-A-V-R-K, wetflyswing.com slash maverick. Check out the lightest and most unique Euro nymphing reel right now. Brent Bauer is here to take us back into Umqua and some of the top selling flies and products they have in their line. We hear about how a fly makes it through the Umqua cut list, what the process looks like, and some funny stories and some of their most popular flies of all time. A man who has been at Umqua from way back in the day. Here we go, Brent Bauer from Umqua.com. How's it going, Brent? Going great. Good to be here, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for taking a little time uh, today to put this one together. Are you at uh, Umqua headquarters right now? I am uh, Louisville, Colorado. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Louisville. I saw that. I was like, Louisville, was that? I thought it was somewhere else. What would be the other thing people would think you are from? Uh, yeah. Everybody thinks it's Louisville, like the Louisville slugger. Exactly. Kentucky, right? Yeah. That is not us. <laughs> no, it's not you. Yeah. Louisville. Okay. So, yeah, you guys are in Colorado and um, we've talked a little about the history. We've had at least one full, you know, kind of podcast episode on Umqua and the history. I'll put a link to that one in the show notes where we dug into, you know, some of the history and how it transitioned out from when it was in Oregon and went out to Colorado. Um, but today, I think we're going to dig into some of your products, a little bit about, you know, kind of what's going on with flies, maybe talk about a little intro to 2023. But before we get there, let's take it real quick back to fishing with you. How did you, uh, you know, get into fly fishing? How did it all start? Yeah, so I, I was a late bloomer as far as fly fishing goes. Um, I, I grew up mostly, at least in my teenage years, in Oregon. And we literally lived on the coast fork of the Lo Willamette River. And my brother, I had two older brothers. My oldest brother got into fly fishing um, yeah, when I was just, just started college and started inviting me on trips, mostly on the Deschutes. And so I, I literally started my, eh, probably my freshman year in college, messing around with it with my brother. And, you know, immediately, you know, I think like most people, you know, hooked a fish and just went deep, started time fly, you know, just, yeah, I was in for the long ride, you know, in a moment. Right. It was instant. So how your brothers that you said two older brothers? Yeah. Um, yeah. My oldest brother's four years older than me. We lived in Oregon at the time. Um, so yeah, and it was mostly Oregon stuff, Oregon lakes, Oregon rivers, the Deschutes was, was kind of the benchmark. What town were you in out there in Oregon? I was in a tiny little town uh, called Pleasant Hill, Oregon. It's just east of Eugene. Um, yeah. My dad 
taught at the University of Oregon. I went to a tiny little private school out in the the boondocks of of Oregon. And uh, yeah, lived on seven acres right on the coast fork of the Lamed. It was kind of an idyllic, idyllic place to be as a as a young teenager. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Are they still out there on that seven acres? No, they're not. Sadly, we uh, sold the place. We moved to Southern California when I was uh, a sophomore in in high school. So, oh wow, yeah, was that a good change heading down south? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't see it as necessarily good or bad as an Oregon boy uh, moving to Southern California. You know, there's a lot of images in your mind as a kid. You know, the beach, surfing, all that, you know, that was that was pretty enticing to me. Kind of like fly fishing when I, you know, <laughs> caught my first wave I was I was in. <laughs> um, so yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a great time to be in Southern California. This is this is early 80s, and we were in North County, San Diego. So it wasn't very developed. My dad did construction. So yeah, I had a blast. Uh, loved it. And uh, yes, went back a lot. Even before that, my dad had jobs down in Southern California and I, we would bounce back and forth. I was kind of a, a construction site rat, you know, as the boss's kid. It was like, hey, I'm digging ditches, I'm, you know, demo and stuff, whatever, <laughs> whatever they don't need somebody with any skills doing. That was that was me all summer long. Oh, uh, how old were you when you're on the construction sites? Yeah, roughly. Well, most of my life, but cash in a check, you know, I'd say between 14 and 18 kind of thing. Yeah. So now in the time, I'm just trying to get this uh, kind of in my mind. So you said your dad was a college professor? Yeah, he did. He Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we don't necessarily need to get into all that, but he was a pastor who did construction on the side for quite some time. And then, uh, Another long story, kind of got kicked out of slash left the church and then started doing a, a development construction, you know, full time. And that's kind of why our move to Southern California happened. Okay. And then where was the Eugene, um, that piece? Was it U of O? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was a instructor at U of O? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when was that? Was that before? So that was obviously when you guys were that, that was 70s. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah gotcha. So yeah. you're young. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. 70s, he was, uh, yep. And then moved off of that into the, the construction and the down to the Cali. Yep. Mm -hmm. There you go. So yeah, I just trying to get that. It's always interesting <laughs> because, you know, I mean, obviously I'm sure your dad, like all of us, you know, you have influences from parents and, um, you know, it's part of your journey. So where did the Umqua, you know, how did you connect with Umqua? They were down in um, just south of Eugene, right at the time. Yeah. So the Umqua piece, again, I was kind of a late bloomer at Umqua as well. So I was kind of a chronic college student. I was in college off and on. Um, I graduated in 1985 from high school and graduated from college in 93 or 94 and was just kind of, you know, I started in business, then finally found my niche in biology. I got an undergraduate biology degree from the U University of San Diego, huge into the fish world from a scientific point of view, ecology mostly, and, you know, plan to go to graduate school. My wife, who I met at the University of San Diego in a, in a chemistry lab, she ended up going to graduate school in Texas before we got married. And so I went down to be with her while she was getting her PhD in molecular genetics and decided to Hey, I fly fish. I'll just work in a fly shop while she's doing this. So my first professional gig in fly fishing was West Bank Anglers in Houston, Texas, believe it or not, hmm. um, which is a strange thing. Most people don't even know West Bank Anglers ever had a shop down there. It's since closed, but I worked there from 97 to 2000. And when my wife graduated, you know, I'm not a fan of living in that area. I was like, we're moving back to Oregon. So I immediately started searching for work. Um, and this was 2000. I, I uh, had a job interview. I had, I had two job interviews in Oregon. I was still in Houston. So I flew back, interviewed for a fisheries job and the Umpqua job. 
you know, decided on the Umpqua job. It was either live in a trailer and work at a fishery, the hatchery, or, you know, work at Umpqua. And it was an easy choice for me. Um, I just, something about flies and me. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just, uh, it was yeah. a no brainer. It was a dream job. You had that addiction. Yeah. So I couldn't believe I was going to work for Umpqua and was going to sit side by side with the guys who decide what flies go in the book. Yeah. That's right. So that was in early 2000. Who was there when you went into Umqua? Who are the guys at the table or, you know, running the show or who are you working with? So the, the president was Nick Murphy and Jeff Fryhover, who's now the president. Um, he was a sales guy at the time. He and Nick Murphy interviewed me. Nick Murphy said, yes, Jeff, my current boss said no at the time, mm. um, which we laugh about right now <laughs> daily, but, uh, but anyway, they took me on. Dave Hall, who you may have heard of when you were talking about the history of Umpqua, he was the fly guy at the time and uh, great guy. I came in with a title of dealer support manager. I was kind of a, you know, I worked for the sales manager, worked with key accounts, big box accounts, did some just kind of bundled new product stuff, but I was primarily hired to sell kind of a, a website plug-in so that dealers could um, sell every SKU that Umpqua offered through a portal system, you know, that could, you know, basically clicked on flies on somebody's website and then our website kind of populated right. their frame and we would drop ship the flies for the dealer. It's a great idea, not necessarily a, uh, great in execution or great in, in me being the guy selling it. So uh, that went to the wayside. Um, but that was my first gig. I, I did that for a couple of years. Yeah. Did you have experience with like website stuff or was that something you were learning on the way? Zero. Yeah. Right. So you're in there and, and I remember when uh, I'm trying to think of the episode number, but when we were talking about the history, there was a little bit of a, uh, like, were you there? You were probably there. Running, there was a little bit of a downturn, right? Where Umpqua kind of took a downturn, but that yeah. has really rebounded big time. What was that? Take us there for a moment. What was that like? So, you know, Dennis Black, our founder, you know, owned the company for the early decades and, uh, you know, from 72 to late 90s. When I started... A capital investment group had purchased Umpwa. Oh, that's right. And they're, you know, I don't want to try to get inside their heads, but the perception from my point of view, and I was a low man on the totem pole at this time, was to kind of fluff us up and sell us. And our numbers did not look good at that time. We were basically highly leveraged by banks. And yeah, our cash position was horrible. You know, we had restrictions on all these various ratios that you know banks look at and uh, it was a very difficult situation to be in so luckily one of the guys from this capital investment group our current owner um, Hans Bosch great guy he did not like where they were going saw a great opportunity for the company he's an extremely smart businessman he bought out all those guys and became our, our sole owner, you know, all that negative balance went away and we had a fresh start with, and we literally, since that day, if you look at the company today, it's hard not to go back to that moment and say, you know, Hans Bosch saved Umpwa. It's why we exist right. today. There's nothing you could point to <laughs> that was more important in us getting back our mojo than that decision. And, you know, he's, we literally, you know, we pay cash for everything have since then. And, you know, we don't take out loans. We don't, and it's not that he's carrying us. It's just that we're making smart business decisions, you know, from that point on. So it, it had a huge impact. I didn't understand it as well as I do now at the time, but man, looking back, I'm like, Every time I every time I see the guy, I want to just give him a big hug. I know, I know. That's why I kind of was wanted to go there for a second because I know Russ. It was Russ uh, in uh, Russ Miller in episode three hundred three 
where we dug into some of that history. Um, you know, he told the yeah. same story there and it was just, it was like, wow, yeah, this guy turned it around. It was going the wrong way. And, and that's a pretty amazing story. What for Hans, you know, that you've been around him, I mean, is there something that, you know, you've kind of learned from him over the years or maybe something somebody here listening with a business could maybe take a lesson learned from him or that something you've, you know, learned from him? Uh, yeah. Oh, it's hard to, to sum it up, but, uh, yeah, you know, I was at uh, at a wedding he was at, and he can't. He talks business at any situation. Oh, right, he loves it. So he's totally business is his thing. He's like, he yeah. can't turn it off. I mean, no, I mean he can, but it's rare that you don't discuss it at any event. And uh, yeah, he'll talk with you about your personal finances, whatever. He has no filter in that regard, which I I greatly appreciate. But yeah, you know, it's really simple stuff i you know you're not gonna learn this stuff as an mba in business school <laughs> which you know by the way i i went back and got my mba in business while i was working for Umpqua, but oh you did <laughs> not to digress but simply you know not saving and not spending what you don't have i mean that's the kind of stuff he talks about our business is extremely complicated because flies are just the most complicated category in fly fishing. Oh, it is. Yeah. Because there's just so many skews and stuff like that. So many skews, all produced hand tied out of kind of unique raw materials. You know, think about it. We have kind of 5,000 truly kind of active, profitable skews just in the fly category. That doesn't include all the other categories. And so imagine every one of those fly patterns has you know five to ten different you know ingredients oh yeah and i would say 70 percent of those ingredients are sourced here in the u.s shipped overseas to our factories requiring u.s fish and wildlife usda paperwork right. uh, the lead times are crazy you know you've got you've got deer hair elk hair that you know you want it killed as, at a specific time so the hair has certain properties so you buy oh, it wow. at a certain time you inventory it you know and you have to account for a bad year and you know it's insane i used to buy all the raw materials and ship them to the factories i loved it it was probably one of my probably my second favorite job at uncle i've had like five but uh if you tie flies you know, sourcing the raw materials and solving the problems that come up, which are endless daily. It's a dream job. If you're into that kind of stuff, it's a nightmare. If you're not, um, most people are not cut out for that, but, uh, and then the, you know, there's bird flu banning feather imports. Imagine if banning feather imports and you're a fly right. manufacturer overseas. I mean, the stuff never stops mad cow disease. Uh, it can't ship calf tails. It never ends, literally. Oh my goodness. Wow. I think every time I look at the guy who does it now, I'm just like, oh man, I don't envy you right now. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Because you guys are producing also, yeah, it's not like you're doing a few flies. I mean, you guys are putting out a lot of flies, probably more than, you know, most, right? Oh, more than anybody by a long shot. Yeah. By a long shot. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. That's it. So you got this process. So, and that's just one thing going, I mean, that obviously is what put you on the map, but you guys are doing some different stuff too now, right? As far as you still have the flies, but you've dove into some of the other product. Is that a little bit uh, more, a little more straightforward than the flies? It is, you know, and most people don't know that, you know, we are the, the first company to do um, tapered levers, fluorocarbon. People don't necessarily think of us as a, as a leader in Tivit company. Um, but we have been for 40 plus years. You know, we introduced the first hooks, uh, chemically sharpened hooks through Tiemco that were specifically designed for fly fishing. Um, we're the largest seller of fly fishing hooks in the U.S. and the world. It's a huge category for us. Obviously, you know, all those flies have to be tied on something. And it's a huge uh, competitive advantage for us to have the best hooks on the market too, because then we can leverage that into it. You know, our flies, you know, 90 plus percent of them have, are tied on Tiemco hooks. You know, there's, there's no better hook, you know, in the world. You know, Japanese steel, 
uh, designed specifically for fly fishing. I mean, you just buy people have been doing it forever. You know, it's, it's a huge, huge part of our business. Yeah. And that, I remember Russ mentioned that too. So that is the TMCO. So you guys are just, um, you basically own TMCO or that, or that? No, 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 we no. don't, we don't own them. We're the North American distributor. Mm. Um, so they're, they're a Japanese company. So, uh, so yeah, we, we don't own them. Gotcha. We now do some of our own hook design and development as well, which has been very successful for us as well. So, uh, so yeah, the hook category, yeah, I would say at where I would say we're in five categories. That's number two to flies. That's number two. There you go. So you got flies, you got hooks. What are the other three categories? So we, we categorize the other products as, so, um, I guess I'll just do them in descending order. Leader and tippet would be after hooks, very closely aligned to stream side accessories. Stream side accessories is kind of a catch all category. Um, it includes everything from fly boxes to indicators, the hemostats to you name it. And uh, it's a category that's, uh, you know, I'd say a lot of our categories are very mature in that they, you know, they're kind of where they're at. And, you know, there's, you know, there's mild, you know, organic growth in them, you know, like flies and hooks would be uh, categories like that. Whereas streamside accessories, it's a strongly growing category that, you know, we're, we're very focused on. And then you've got uh, fly tying tools, fly tying materials. Um, oh, right. And hooks. Yeah. Yeah. So flies, hooks, leader, tippet, streamside, and fly tying. Mm. And accessories would include uh, all your bags and stuff like that. Well, yeah. Um, thank you for bringing I'm, I missed the bags. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so packs and bags is the category that we got into. Um, eh, we're pushing, I'd say, 10 years almost on that. So, yeah, that's a great category as well. Um, it's very different from any of the other categories we're in. But love the category, particularly from a, as a I'm the director of product. I don't know if we've even discussed that. My day job is product. Me and Jeff, my employee, other Jeff, not our president, um, we handle all new product design and development in all of those categories. Does that include, that's products that wouldn't include necessarily new fly pattern products, or is that all everything? No, it's new flies as well. Yeah, everything. Gotcha. Yeah, literally everything. So from a design and development standpoint, you know, all those categories are very different in how, you know, the fly category we've been doing so long, it's almost like automatic. It's just in our DNA. You know, a lot of the other categories are just very different. Like you don't need a CAD file to design a, you know, and develop a new fly, right? Right. You know, you don't need to send a, a spec package to a cut and sew factor. <laughs> you know, they're all very, they're all very different hook design. Um, you know, some just lean harder on the supplier for kind of the design and development. Um, whereas some others require a lot more work up front. So very different. I, I love them all, but, uh, uh it'd be hard, hard to pick a favorite, but some are definitely easier than others. Yeah. What about on the fly? So I think we may have talked about this in the past, but you know, how do you determine whether, you know, you get a fly in there, it comes in, whether that fly is going to make it, is it just a numbers game? Like it's got to make a certain number of sales or, you know, cause you get, you probably get a lot of submissions and the things that make it in, but then don't make it for the long term. Right. Well, just probably worth clarifying. Unlike any of the other product categories, you know, we have a signature fly designer program with flies. So it's the only category where most of our new product comes from outside designers. So, you know, Charlie Craven, a Mike Mercer, those guys send patterns in. We have a, a fly committee, which I kind of alluded to earlier. You know, the day I started in 2000, I was invited to join the fly committee and it was probably like the most exciting thing that ever happened to me <laughs> professionally. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I'm going to be sitting here deciding whether, you know, Mike Mercer's fly goes in the catalog. You know, it's right. I'm just like, how did I get here? So anyway, I've been on that committee, you know, for 22 years now. And 
Jeff Fry over and I are Jeff Fry was our president. He and I have both been on that committee, uh, you know, since I started, he's been on it longer. And then, uh, we have, uh, three other guys on that committee with a lot of history. You know, Dave Hall was on it, you know, back in the day, our fly guy. So anyway, those flies come in. We as a committee typically annually will decide, you know, kind of some parameters around, you know, what we're looking for. A great fly is always on our list of things to add, obviously, but yeah. sometimes there are categories we're looking to fill in or expand. Like maybe it's streamers one year, maybe it's foam attractors one year. Right now, you know, tactical Euro type of flies are certainly. Um, yeah. Will you request, will you go out to your people, you know, and say, hey, we really need more Euro nymphs this year and, and kind of request that? Or is that just you let it go how it flows? Yeah, you know, we don't do a lot of going out and asking for stuff. It usually happens kind of organically. Although, you know, if there's a if there's a trend and I see, like, for example, um, a fly that we currently sell as a standard nymph, and, you know, I think we ought to do a jigged version, you know, I'll call the tire and say, hey, you know, I'd love to see this, you know, tie it on this hook. And the tire, you know, nine times out of 10, very willing, you know, it's just, yeah, let's cash some checks. Or if there's a, there's a hatch or a color that's trending and we're not doing it yet, we'll, we'll call the tire and, you know, we do a fly called a, a peaches and cream, um, great selling little tactical nymph you're watching wimbledon one day oh, hey why don't you do a strawberries and cream you know mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah. sometimes it can be as simple as that yeah right but uh anyway and usually the tires are very tuned into it but some of them you know they may have started with us 20 years ago and aren't terribly active anymore and sometimes they need a need a nudge of something that's an opportunity so so we do it all, but uh, mostly it's very organic and it reflects because of that. You know, a lot of our signature fly designers um, work at shops, own shops, guide. They know what's happening out there. And so uh, it's very reflective of what's in demand. You know, It's an interesting, uh, it's one of those things I, somebody's asking me, um, we did an episode recently. We were talking about hot spotting. That was a question that I was asked. Like, well, how do you feel about uh, hot spotting? Right, where you're actually like, we're on the show, right? I interview a lot of people. You're giving away places, right? And the way I think about that is, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to allow my guests to decide, right, <laughs> what they want to give <laughs> away. And uh, I mean, but for you guys, like these people, these signature tires are giving away maybe their best. I mean, how do you think they deal with that? Like, do you think they're giving away? their greatest fly or are they still holding some secrets back? Oh, but you know, there are people that are on both sides of that fence and, uh, yeah, there are cases where we've seen some, you know, a lot of, a lot of these tires tie commercially as well. So they're not, you know, not only are we selling their flies, they're manufacturing and selling their own flies. So, uh, there are times where we've seen a fly that they're making, you know, and selling, uh, themselves and, which is okay to do. It is okay to do, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, and we've asked them to to send it in, and yeah, you know, sometimes that's all they need, or some, you know, I'm sure there are some out there I don't know about, but uh, I think usually there, people love to see, you know, their bugs in production and out there. I mean, I don't think there's a lot of holding back. Yeah. That makes sense. You know, I think there are categories where you see that more than others, like steelhead and salt. You'd see that probably more more than in trout, just because one, there's there's a much smaller opportunity to make money on those categories from a royalty standpoint. There's just yeah, not a lot of steelhead flies are really sold in the grand scheme of things. Uh, so as a signature fly designer, if you want to make money. If that's your primary goal, trout is really where it's salt, you know, has some pretty big opportunities actually, but it depends on, you know, if it's depends on the subcategory in salt water, you know? Right. What do you think salt, when you compare it? So flies, you've got 
you know, just trout in general, and then you got steelhead and salt. Like, what percentage wise do you think is salt a lot bigger than steelhead, or are they similar? Oh yeah, yeah, it's a lot bigger. Salt is is huge compared to steelhead. Yeah, huge. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So steelhead's the tiny, super tiny niche within a niche, yep. and then salt is growing. Yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, salt is growing, right? Because that is becoming more popular. As people kind of elevate through their journey, salt is always that thing, right? As you get to that next level, you start with trout, and maybe salt is where you get eventually. Yeah, and with with more travel and more access, you know, I, I think about when I started fly fishing. You know, nobody was really going to the Seychelles or come chalk you know no well they're still not <laughs> for well, the most part there's they're still not going there that's <laughs> a small percentage of uh you know wealthy people but yeah no right. i hear you though yeah Kemchuk. Uh, we did an episode on Kemchuk. it was like wow yeah. that one was i mean right you've got to go there but that's another one of those really tough ones but i mean these are aspirational places to go right and we all think about it I, i'm lucky enough to have been there oh wow you've been to Kemchaka? no the seychelles Alphonse. Oh, wow. There you go. Amazing. But these are aspirational places to go and they inspire people to, you know, whether they're going to the Bahamas or Cuba or wherever. I, I mean, and those people are buying, you know, usually your, your wealthy angler is not spending a ton of free time, like tying his own flies. I think they're, they're more likely to buy those flies. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So I think travel is, has helped uh, that category a lot. Yeah, travel's huge. Yeah. What are on the categories for you guys? So what are the, if you kind of look at the big categories you got, we talked about them, you got salt, you got trout, but within trout, there's other categories. What are your kind of top selling categories? So yeah, w within trout, um, you know, big categories. Obviously, when I started and before me, you know, dry flies outsold nymphs. Since then, they've evolved, and, and nymphs now outsell dry flies, just to start there. Then when you delve into just trout in general, within the nymph category, you know, tungsten beadhead nymphs really started trending, you know, a while back. And then, you know, within the last five to ten years, you know, the whole Euro tactical uh, subcategory within nymphs and dries, uh, terrestrials, are huge in dry flies, by the way. So, um, you know, like a chubby Chernobyl, you know, huge. So that's our top selling, yep. you know, dry fly, you know, things like hippie stompers. Right. What about all the old traditional stuff, like the old cat skill style, the stuff that I feel is like super hard to tie. Do you guys sell a lot of that? Very little cat skill stuff, you know, like the parachute Adams size 16 used to be our top selling fly. Yeah, it's still right up there, believe it or not. But like the Prince Nymph used to be, you know, top five. It's not even in our, you know, top 20 anymore. It's out. What about the hare's ear, the pheasant tail, that stuff? Yeah, those are, you know, the pheasant tail has definitely stayed strong, but in different variations than kind of the old traditional style. But it, it's, you know, it's not in our, top 20 anymore whereas things like um frenchies blow torches you know a lot of that tactical stuff is starting to to leapfrog up the list right does that vary between when you're going between years do you guys see it are you keeping track every year like these are you know these are the top 20 now this year and then we can see the leapfrogging oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah you know what's going on right yeah yeah absolutely and uh, we do extremely well with dry flies in general. Kind of from a quality standpoint, dry flies are the hardest flies to tie. Exactly. Yeah. And we do an amazing job at dry flies in particular. We do, I mean, what else am I going to say, obviously? But yeah, it's true. Yeah. They're hard. I knew it before I started working for Elqua. Uh, But we really, you know, the stimulator is kind of a. Yeah. The stimulator. Who was that fly? Was that? Uh, that was Randall Kaufman. Yeah, that was him. That, and he yeah. was the guy at the at the beginning of the company, right? Yeah, the very beginning. Uh, he and uh, Dennis Black used to, you know, they they basically sat in a basement, tied flies, and hit the road with a van and sold them. 
That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. they, the story I, the story that was painted was it was kind of like, yeah, downstairs smoking weed, tying flies, traveling around the country. So, you know what I mean? Like a couple of hippies. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the, the hippie stuff, right? That's pretty funny that you you still get some of that. You know, those, those naming things are kind of funny. <laughs> naming is a, a funny part of the business for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, as far as categories go, midges and mergers are huge. Um, you know, the Southern Rockies is our biggest territory and tailwater fisheries are a large part of that. So, so midges and emergers are a huge category for us. Another category that's trending, uh, we call it, we have various terms for it. Here's some of which I can say, uh, but junk flies, worms, eggs, et cetera. Um, those types of flies are definitely, uh, definitely trending. Yeah. Right. Right. The worms. Yeah. The squ- all that stuff. The easy stuff, really. That's yeah, the easy yeah. stuff to tie. Yeah, streamers always solid, um, but that, you know, trout. I would say it's kind of a seventy thirty rule as far as you know. There's trout, and then there's everything else. You know, and salt comprises most of the everything else. Oh, it does, right? Yeah. So salt's taking a good. It's like a almost like a eighty twenty sort of thing or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, within the other, you know, the not 70, there's warm water, you know, bass and panfish. Yeah, not a huge category, but solid. Um, And now we've got this jungle category with guys going down to South America and fishing for Dorado and peacock bass, et cetera. Today's episode is sponsored by Trestle, who has earned an exceptional reputation over the past few years in the fly fishing industry due to the popularity of their telescopic fly rod roof racks and statement-making artist series apparel lines. Their latest release for 2023 is the Jerian Universal Bike Rack Packing System, a brand new way to transport your fly fishing and outdoor gear. The Jerion will give any modern bike the ability to bring 30 pounds of gear with its front and rear articulated racks. Whether you ride a full suspension mountain bike, an e-bike, or even a carbon fiber road bike, the Jerion will get you and your fishing gear further faster and have much more fun along the way. I can tell you this has been a big struggle for me. I've been riding my bike, uh, both road bikes and mountain bikes, and had lots of issues over the years packing my gear, whether that's uh, crappy uh, storage on the back or a trailer that's just too big and bulky. So I'm excited to share this packing system, which is going to make it way more convenient and accessible to get out to the places you need to go. You can learn more about how Trestle is transforming the way you access your favorite water, backcountry hunting zones, and camping spots. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Trestle right now and be the first on the water and the farthest upstream and away from the crowds. That's Trestle, T-R-X-S-T-L-E. Trestle, live your pursuit. How do you guys do the um, the naming? You mentioned the naming. Like, how do you... You know, there's been some of that on social media. Occasionally, you'll see some blow up with, you know, some Kelly Gallup name fly or something. <laughs> I mean, yeah. do you guys, you know, I mean, that's something you got to think about, right? Do you kind of, um, you know, tamp that down sometimes? Get a fly that's kind of the name is not going to work. So you're like, well, can you tweak it to this? Yes, absolutely. That happens regularly. And uh, yeah, you'll see certainly less and less of that. I think, you know, there's some, there's fun names and then there's just crass, you know, inappropriate names. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, right. and fly fishing, it's a very, you know, good old boys club and that historically, you know, less so every day, thank goodness. But um, yeah, we're, we're moving in away from that kind of stuff. There's some old relics that still hang around uh, that you yeah, you're not going to see new stuff from us uh, with that kind of issue. Right. No, that's definitely, yeah, we're moved away from that. What's the, um, so you talk about top fives. Can you give us a rundown? You mentioned some of them, but just some of your, your best sellers. Yeah. So dry fly wise, um, chubby Chernobyl's, like I said, elk caddis, still great selling fly. Yep. What color elk hair? Oh, just, you know, tan is you know, definitely the, the go-to, you know, we've got, um, like I said, hippie stompers. So the hippie stomper is one of the top flies. Yeah. One of the top dry flies. And that one goes like, tell me this of the hippie stomper, because 
I mean, you got to fly and we've had, you know, we've had, uh, we've talked about that fly on this podcast and the history there. That's got a pretty amazing story there. But, um, I mean, how much of that is the name and how much is the fly? Because that is a pretty intense name that sticks out above, say, the elk hair caddis. Yeah, it's a great name. Obviously, and names can help, you know, a fly just get some buzz around it. But personally, and people here at work will tell you, all Brent does is fish a hippie stopper when he's fishing dry flies. It is literally, it catches fish is why it's so popular. It is just a deadly fly. I will tell you, if you're looking, nobody comes to me for fishing advice, and that's for good reason. I don't fish a lot. But the only advice I'll give you is if you're going to tie on a dry fly and you don't know what's going on or what you're doing, tie on a red size 14 hippie stopper. <laughs> it's like, I, when it, it works for me almost every time. It's, it's a deadly fly. There you go. All right. The hippie stopper. And then now if you compare the hippie stopper to the, the missing link, which one are you? I mean, I know which one you're probably going for, but that's a pretty close battle. Well, I, you know, I'm not, I don't go out on the river and just tie on a hippie stopper. I mean, a missing link is a much more match the hatch style of fly. A hippie stopper is an attractor. It's, it's what you tie on when you don't know what's going on or there's no hatch. So, you know, if there's a hatch coming off, I'd match it with a missing link, obviously, before I just tie on a hippie stopper. Missing links, fantastic fly. My preferred type of fishing is, uh, you know, freestone dry fly fishing where not too technical. So if you ask me what, <laughs> that's the perspective I'm coming from. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. All right. Okay. And you guys weren't on the hippie stuff or not worried about uh, pissing off any of the hippies out there? No, no, no. We, do, we don't get flack for the hippie stopper. Yeah. No, everybody knows what that's about. Yeah, Andrew Grillos designed that fly, and we've we collaborated recently to. Uh, he's got a new fly that we launched a couple of years ago called the Mini Hippie Stopper. Oh, nice! And uh, this is a good example of how the collaboration works. If you're interested, yeah, let's hear it. So Andrew comes to us, and he he's like, "I want to tie my Hippie Stopper smaller." You know, they only we only tie him down to a size 16, and so I'm like, "Well, you know, we." When we get smaller with that fly, you know, it loses a lot of gap with that hook. So we we just designed and developed a new hook called the Stubby T, which allowed us to tie chubby Chernobyl smaller yet still maintains the big gap. So or gape, whatever you want to refer to it as. So so anyway, Andrew, you know, submitted them on a different hook, and I was like, instead of just making it a smaller hippie stopper. Let's call it the mini hippie stomper and tie it on this different hook. And we did it and it's just killed. I mean, it's it's just, you know, we we just done fantastic with it. And that's that's the kind of stuff, you know, it's great when a fly comes together like that. Yeah. Um, versus, you know, if you just added a size 18 to the standard hippie stomper, you know, you probably wouldn't get a lot of attention, you know, and it probably wouldn't do that well. But you introduce it as a new fly on a hook that's really custom built for that application, you know, we're, we're giving the angler a better product and a better day on the water. Um, yeah. Right. By, you know, by giving them a better product. So. Right. Another skew, another skew in there as a product guy, you know, we just eat that kind of stuff up. We love it. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's the same pattern. You just probably, I mean, same materials, you're doing a new hook and you can get, you know, now you've got maybe another top 20 fly, right? Now you got the hippie, the mini hippie stomper in there too. Yeah. 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 You use different materials that are appropriate, you know, thinner foam, fewer layers, whatever it is, but you know, you can't just, you can't take a fly that you tie in a size, you know, eight through 14 and then just use the same design and go down to 20 and think it's going to, work you know yeah exactly we had um just want to highlight that 339 andrew grillos was on and um yeah he told that story i mean his story is amazing because he had this uh stroke right 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 and he was a an amazing like a ultra runner and it was just this crazy thing and he's been recovering from it. and it's so good to hear now you guys are talking to him because that means that he's still recovering right so that's a pretty awesome awesome to hear yeah well well this happened the mini hippie stopper was accepted you know i hope i think i'm getting this right before he he had those issues 
Oh, wow. Wow. Gotcha. Yeah, right. But they weren't developed yet. So I literally, you know, normally the tire ties the samples that go to the factory. Yeah. I tied those samples. <laughs> and, uh, oh, wow. You know, because Andrew was out for the count. But yeah, he's doing much better. I, I literally just talked to him a couple of weeks ago. He's in, in Kauai right now. He moved out there just to kind of. Oh, he did. He moved to Kauai. Yeah, to help, you know, kind of recover and get back on track. So. Oh, wow. I love that. God, he's lucky. I mean, lucky on that. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's keep this going. So we've got we've got a couple of few dry flies. Let's go to the nymphs. So you probably mentioned these, but give us some of the top, a few top nymphs right now for you guys. Historically, Copper John, 2-bit hooker size 16 reds have been huge they still are they are still way up there but like i said the frenchie the blowtorch those have quickly been kind of leapfrogging up with those um these kind of tactical euro flies our tungsten zebra midge it's always just been a killer i mean and if you again you know i recommended fishing a hippie stopper if you fish subsurface Tying a zebra midge. If you're fishing any of our tailwaters here, it's hard to beat. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, you know, from a nymph side, you know, that's really what's going. Those are good. And that's another good name. So you got the hippie stomper and the, the two butt hooker is another one of those not totally, uh, you know, uh, PC, PC, but names, it's still, yeah. but it's still not, uh, again, it's one of those things where you got to, you can't be PC on everything, right? Or perfectly. Yeah, no, and feel free to call it the two bit. Yeah, the two bit, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Let's go to streamers. So, what do you got for streamers? Give us the top. I've got some ideas of what might be there, but what do you guys have on your list? Well, one of the oldest flies out there from a streamer standpoint, the Clouser Minnow, still up there, believe it or not. Just a great, you know, universal kind of pattern. What about going into like the trout? What about all the crazy, um, uh, you know, the Blaine chocolate type stuff or the, uh, or even like the old school, even like the muddler, right? That sort of stuff. Is there anything in that category still there? Yeah. Muddler's really not, um, not in the mix too much anymore, uh, but yeah, you know, things like, uh, John Barr's meat whistle, still a great fly, great selling fly. Um, mini leeches are huge, you know, land and mares fly. That's a great fly and fishes extremely well in technical waters as well. You know, a lot of people are doing the, you know, bouncing a mini leech with kind of a Euro fly off the back or something like that. You know, the double gonga, the gonga from Craven, great selling fly, um, great catching fly. Yeah, those are, those are a few. Those are some top. Perfect. Let's keep it on. So we got dry flies, nymphs, streamers. Are wet flies up there in your top 20 at all? Is there anything there? Yeah, no. You know, if you're talking like soft hackles and things like that. Yeah, soft hackles or what, I mean, even like the old school, right? Even you think of like um, uh, Davey Watton, right? With all his, the old school wings. And, yeah. But what are the, I don't even know what the category is. Like what are, are there wet flies that aren't soft hackles? What would that be? Well, like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of like a guide's choice hair's ear. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's kind of a mix between a, a nymph and a wet fly kind of, right? Yeah, that is just a fantastic fishing and selling fly for us if you want to throw that in that category. Yeah, that is a good one. So that would make the top 20 probably? No, there's no wet flies on the top 20. Oh, there's no, that's the thing. So basically yeah. just scratch the, the wet flies out. So you got, yeah. I mean, the top 20 would be dry flies, nymphs. Would those streamers be making the top 20? Nope. No, so it's really down to literally dry flies, nymphs. Yeah, yeah. And some in, in the dry fly category, you know, there's terrestrials and, and then just standard primarily. Uh, Amy's ants up there, you know, great, great uh, attractor terrestrial. Um, stimulator still up there. I would say that's up there just because we tie such a nice fly. It probably wouldn't be in another manufacturer's top 20. Yeah. God, I remember tying that fly. I remember just first seeing the stimulator and I've tied a lot of flies and, and then, you know, and trying to tie that, right. It's like, Oh my <laughs> right, God. Right. And then I remember always just thinking like, who in the heck tied this fly? Cause this is, there's no way I'm ever going to tie a fly this tight because of those hackles, you know what I mean? And, oh, yeah. and now it makes sense because you guys built uh, essentially kind of this empire around 
the quality. I mean, that's, I mean, when you guys look at your flies, what do you think kind of like has put you on the map, set you apart in the fly space? Is it just the quality or is it more the, the, the operations piece? Well, I, I think the signature fly designer program just literally, you know, when we, you know, Dave Whitlock was our first signature fly designer. Yeah. And his flies are extremely difficult flies to tie, particularly his deer hair stuff. When we proved to the world that we could commercially tie flies of that quality, you know, fly tires started knocking on our door, you know, Mike Lawson, um, you know, all these, these big names, Craven, Barr, uh, Mike Mercer. So that program in and of itself, I think is responsible for, for the best of the best, you know, coming to us. It's like they couldn't go anywhere else and get paid for, for not tying their flies. You know, they would have had a, you know, tying flies commercially. That's a brutal, brutal job. Yeah. It's tough. I know a lot of people who do that. And most of them are borderline insane. All right. (laughs) I love a lot of them, but you you have to have a a special mindset to be able to sit down and and crank out flies all day long. I mean, I've tied commercially for a shop where I go home at night after work and tie. And that by itself is, it's a lot. So. Yeah, you probably got burnout. I did some of it too, and it is it's it's easy to get burnout because it's yeah. just the uh, yeah you're tying eight, ten dozen flies a day, you know, no matter what. That's uh, that's a lot. And I would say the the other aspect is Dennis Black. You know, when when he went over and created the relationships that he did in Sri Lanka and Thailand and India, you know, the early factory that we had in India you know, one of the biggest pluses to that factory was there was, there was free quality, quality hackle at the time, literally running around outside. So uh, Indian necks and saddles were a large part of the game back in that day. There wasn't genetic, you know, hackle like we have today. So that was a big part of it early on. And, you know, he was the best of the best commercial tire as well. So he and uh, Kaufman, you know, sitting down there cranking out flies, they trained up, you know, the people that ended up training up all the other tires at these factories. And he, he was over there very regularly. So, you know, and these are the same factories we're working with today by and large. And like Chandra, she's, she's one of the, the main tying instructors at our factory in Sri Lanka she's worked with Dennis Black. I mean, she's been around that long. So we still have those kind of fundamental, you know, people in play at a lot of these factories and that heritage flows downstream. It, it's like, you know, she can tie a size 32 no hackle, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that gives us a picture of just you know, the, the process, right. And I was going to ask that, I mean, you got people that are, and I'm sure you get some people turning over and having to train new people. So essentially, do you have the person you talked about there who has been there, those people are training. So you don't necessarily need to have any folks from the U S head over there. Is, is it all an operation run by them? Yeah. I mean, we, we still go over there. You know, I, I go over there, COVID obviously put a, I was literally in Sri Lanka, um, February when COVID hit and uh, I, uh, you know, people were struggling to get out of Sri Lanka when I got, came back. Oh, Roy. Oh, you mean Americans? Yeah. Well, everybody from everywhere. Um, not a lot of Americans in Sri Lanka, but um, anyway, yeah, we, we travel over there regularly. They're fully capable. You know, if we send samples and instructions and it's a modern world now, you know, back in the day, we couldn't send a video you know, you couldn't send all this stuff. We, you know, Dave Hall always mentions, you know, we hired him because he was an artist, you know, he could draw pictures and tying instructions. You know, now we can just send over a video, you know, and they're, they're dialed, you know? Yeah, they're dialed. So Sri Lanka, I mean, is just off the tip of India. Is it, um, why Sri Lanka? Why not uh, any other part of Southeast Asia or any of the world? Why was it Sri Lanka? 
Well, you know, I, I think a large part of it, you know, our first factory was in, in India and that there was a relationship there, like a lot of things. Uh, Suresh, who, who runs our factory in Sri Lanka, actually went to school here in the U.S., uh, UC Santa Barbara, and, uh, you know, spent time in Oregon. And so his dad was the connection, um, connection there. And uh, the country's culture kind of lends itself to being great at, at, you know, this handcrafted product. Um, Same with our factory in in Thailand. You know, they're just extremely talented with those kinds of things. So, and, you know, our our other factory in Thailand, there are more fly factories per capita. They're in Chiang Mai than anywhere in the world. We were the first. And then other factories came in and they would, you know, if somebody left our factory or they'd try to steal them away so they could get some free expertise. So that's kind of how that happened. Yeah. How many tires do you guys have over there, like kind of for the company? You know, we we try not to throw those numbers around, um, but, you know, we have hundreds of tires at our, each of our factories. That's right. I mean, it's an operation. It's crazy to think about the the volume, right, of all the flies, <laughs> you know, going back and forth. You got the materials going over there, and you got flies coming back here. And we don't just have one factory in Sri Lanka and one factory in Thailand. We we actually have three factories in Sri Lanka, all run by the same individual. And then we have a our factory in Chiang Mai and uh, another factory right across the border in Laos. So uh, yeah, a lot going on over there. Right. So in the last 22 years since you've been there, is the COVID the craziest thing that's kind of happened as far as that overseas work you guys have gone? Yeah, you know, that and, you know, Sri Lanka had a, a tsunami way back. Uh, I went over right after that. Wow. What was that like? It was a big disruption, obviously, to the people of Sri Lanka. Surprisingly, they, I mean, they were just, Sri Lanka was, you know, had civil war, had a lot of um, political and social, you know, they're used to it. So they literally, it's amazing what they'll carry on right through. We hardly saw a blip and the tsunami and, and COVID really. It was just, it was supply chain issues from kind of raw material aspects that really hurt us more than anything else during COVID. But we also had one of our our biggest years in history because of COVID. So, yeah, that's right. COVID was uh, yeah helped with fly fishing too. Nice. Well, let's just take it out of here. We mentioned just before. I want to highlight again some of these the flies we talked. So basically, out of your top flies, it's literally dry flies, nymphs. In dry flies, you've got terrestrials, and you've got some. Uh, I mean, what are the what would make up that say the top you know ten of dry flies of the categories? So yeah, with you know, obviously we break our our categories out pretty um, well defined. You know, just because we like to, we want to see trends. You know, we not only want to see if terrestrials are trending, but if hoppers or beetles or whatever. But terrestrials are always strong, and hoppers in particular, uh, just an incredibly great selling. You know, thunder thigh hoppers, thunder thighs is a is a top you know, 20 patter. Chubby Chernobyl often fished as a hopper, uh, just most more like a kind of a guide, dry dropper rig. Um, just throw on a chubby and tie a couple flies off the back and you're, you're fishing, you know? Yeah, you're good to go. So, yeah, and then, um, yeah, emergers are a great category for us, you know, and midges like Juju Betis from Charlie Craven fantastic fly fantastic selling fly as well as fishing fly and then midges in general like i mentioned the zebra zebra midge that's that's a huge seller okay perfect i think we got a, at least 10 out of you here on that probably made that top <laughs> 20 list so well we won't get all of them today but um but no this has been good anything i mean i think the cool thing about the umqua is is that it's an amazing story you know from where you guys were to where you are now and when you look at, I mean, as the product designer, I mean, this must be 
a little challenging, right? You know, because you're such at the highest level as far as the flies and stuff. I mean, what do you look at as looking out as product development? Where do you go next to keep being different? It happens pretty organically for us, you know, cause I, you know, all of us fish, you know, we have these great relationships with fly shops, guides and the committee. So, you know, I run the, the new product committee and the same people that are on the fly committee are on that committee as well. So we meet regularly and review, you know, we'll sit down and go, okay, what are we doing with hooks this year? you know, and, or what are we doing with hooks in the next three years? You know, and it's not hard when you've got, you know, I've got guys on the U S fly fishing team. You know, I can call up a guide in Florida. I can call up a shop owner in Houston. You need to do that legwork and, you know, having the history that I, you know, me and the team has, you know, interpreting that into something that can be commercially successful yeah, it's not easy, but it the process where you just have to trust the process and make sure you don't just assume you know. So uh, you just you got to do your homework, your legwork, um, and then you know the connections that we have with suppliers is really so important. It's like if we didn't have that long history and those long relationships, it'd be a lot harder. I mean, if if I want to a new dry fly hook, you know, from Tiemco. And I, I know, you know, I want the shank length to be this. I want the gate to be that. It's pretty easy to do that. That wouldn't be very easy for, for some new brand coming in, you know? So. No, that's it. And it, how long has it been? I mean, it's been like 50 years, right? Since Umpqua has been going. Has it been that long? Yeah. Last year was our 50th anniversary. That's right. It was the 50th. So yeah, 71 back, back in the day with, uh, and things are going great. That's good to hear. Let's just, uh, wrap it out of here with the, uh, our quick little two minute drill, which we've been trying to do to force, to force me to, to wrap things up a little bit. But, um, in some of these I'm things, I, yeah, <laughs> no, this is good. I think some of these things you've already answered, so we'll make it even quicker today, but let's start the timer and see if we can get out of here. We'll just ask you a couple of quick questions and, and we'll get it going. So what's your rod? So you got one rod, uh, length and weight. What is it? I'll do a nine and a half four. Awesome. All right. Nine and a half four. So I think we got your one fly was the remind us again. Hippie stomper. Hippie stomper. So you've been to the Seychelles. Uh, I mean, that's amazing. What is your next one trip? You know what I mean? I, it's hard to beat that, but what, what would it be? I'd like to do uh, South America, like Chile, Argentina. Haven't done that. Oh, yeah. 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 For uh, browns or for like? Yeah, just for trout in general. Yeah. All right. We talked a little bit about business briefly on it, but you know, for somebody who there's a lot of people out there doing the fly, right? You see a lot of this out there, the flies, all that stuff. It seems like you're at the head of the game. What do you tell somebody? Do you guys offer advice for any other companies in this, or is it something where it's more like kind of trade secrets or, or would you have some advice for another company listening now? For another manufacturer and fly fishing? Yeah, just a company, you know what I mean? Like, I always feel like for us, you know, with the podcasting, I'm always trying to help other fly fishing podcasts, you know, elevate them because I feel like rising tide, you know what I mean? But do you guys see that or is there a lot of trade secrets where you really kind of feel like you need to to stay at the top? You have to keep it secret. No, I, I mean, I, I don't think there's a lot of secrets, but I think as in somebody new getting in the game, you know, I think credibility and just being real this seems to be something that's been lost a bit in so many industries. I think in fly fishing, less so, but it's still, ha you know, you see all these big brands buying out brands, et cetera. You know, I think at the beginning, there's nothing more important is to be true to what you know and understand, you know, and you know, obviously I'm not going to give people advice on business. I'm a product guy for a business that's successful. <laughs> yeah, your product guy. So we'll ask, uh, we'll ask who's the owner again, revise again, the owner. Uh, Jeff Ryhover should give you that advice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk to Jeff on that. So that'll be good. But no, I mean, that is great advice that you have there is like literally, you know, I mean, even this, the online, it's even more important because being transparent is the thing that is going to make you stand out. Right. I mean, that's so obvious, right. When people are trying to fake something, but if you're yourself, 
You know what I mean? You can't fake right. that. And then you will resonate with other people that are like you, right? Right. I mean, any brand can go out and buy and put their logo on every category. Waiters, you know, nowadays with all the Korean and Chinese suppliers, you can build a brand with no credibility whatsoever. I don't think that's the recipe for success. No, I think that's a recipe. Yeah. I think anybody can get into yeah. it, but I don't think anybody can last 50 years, yeah. Yeah. right? Or whatever you want it to be. So be genuine, do the best possible thing you can do, whether it's your accounting department or your product, you know, pay attention to all that stuff. I'll let, like I said, Fryhover's advice would be much better suited for this commentary. <laughs> yeah, all right. We'll, 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 hit him. we'll hit him up at a later point. So give us the, just as we get out of here, what's, you know, for you guys, 2023 now, are you looking at, do you have some big stuff coming as far as products or are you just kind of doing more of doubling down on what you've been doing? Yeah, no, you know, we've always got new product coming. I mean, my job is literally to keep all of these categories fresh with the best possible product to provide anglers with the best possible time out there on the water so yeah we've got new stuff coming in literally all categories yeah and can you announce i mean can you give us a, a heads up on maybe something that's coming or a little you know insight well we literally just launched our winter product line which i can talk about which we've got a whole new line of barbless dry fly you know, japanese hooks they're in the kind of the tactical defined category um, great hooks you know anytime i can introduce new flies made in japan that fit a category that's just growing you know that's exactly where you want to be these are fantastic hooks a lot of light wire more kind of dry fly emerger uh style stuff but you know japanese steel lets you do light wire hooks that don't bend out you know and that's that's a huge huge advantage for us particularly in the smaller sizes so that's new right now, available literally in shops, just starting right now. They're in the XC series. Um, our X is a hook series competition. It's the tactical line of stuff. We've got uh, some saltwater Deceiver HD in a pink tint. Beautiful product, knots beautifully, disappears uh, in the water, like Deceiver in general. But uh, yeah, if you fish the flats to spooky fish, great product. And then we've got some amazing bobbins from Tiemco. Tiemco was the first to introduce uh, ceramic tube bobbins, you know, decades ago. These are the equivalent of, you know, whatever the latest fine, uh, you know, women's bag is, you know, Italian made kind of thing. You know, highest quality ceramic tubes and steel allow you to you know, just make a super refined, you know, light, small, functional, simple, elegant bobbin. But yeah, that's a small winter launch we've got. And then, you know, I'm not going to give away the farm, but, you know, we, we got work work going on on our uh, UPG fly boxes, got, you know, river grip tools. We've got all sorts of stuff going on and flies never stop. You got all sorts of stuff. So how do you go back to, you know, I guess going back to a question I asked earlier, you know, as far as what makes it, is it just a numbers game to see, you know what I mean? How do you know what's the winners from the new stuff and how do you know what's not? Is it just like, okay, this one isn't making the the numbers sort of thing and then it's out? Well, I mean, I mean, obviously you, you don't know until you put it out, but um, you hope you know. And that's, we look at, you know, why are we launching hooks that are, you know, in the tactical kind of Euro category. Right. You know, this is going to work. Because we know that category is trending. For every 10 products you introduce, only a handful are going to be like really, truly, you know, winners. So, you know, that's just part of the process. Um, for me, it, as long as they're good quality product, it's not going to hurt you if something doesn't sell other than the numbers, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking more, well, also with flies, right? Because you do, that is a part, right? You're not going to, if you got a fly out there that you took in, if it's not selling over time, it's not going to stay in the catalog, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We, we are very aggressive with the uh, discontinue. When you have 10,000 SKUs of product, you can't let that SKU rationalize, rationalization is what we call that. 
we do that. Riley Cotter here, uh, <laughs> I'll throw his, his name out there. Yeah. Do you ever get any uh, angry, angry signature tires? They're like, now wait a minute, that's my favorite fly. Yeah, he gets to do the the math and kill. All, I get to hear about it. <laughs> oh right. So you you get to be the one that's like, uh, yeah, this time yeah. to go. No. Yeah. No. We we get some people that are upset quite regularly, but you know, it is all about the numbers. We are very number driven. We do not let something sit out there just for fun. We wouldn't be in business. Right, right. Nice, Brent. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I think we'll uh, just uh, leave everybody out, uh, let them head out to umqua.com. And I think everybody knows where that is. But I uh, just want to thank you today for all your time and shedding us some, you know, a little light on the product design. I mean, I'm glad we, we dug into this because you uh, are the main guy here. So definitely excited to keep doing some cool stuff with you guys uh, this year. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was, it was a lot of fun. So there it is. Another big one with Umqua Feather Merchants. These guys are leading the way out there and producing some of the highest quality flies on the market right now. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash 422. 422, you can grab some show notes and links and everything we talked about. Hopefully there'll be a video or two as well. And a quick listener shout out uh, before we get out of here today, Mike Sturbus. Mike Sturbus reached out and uh, by email a while back and he said that... Uh, since I've been asking for feedback, he wanted to give a couple of uh, guest suggestions. And uh, and two he gave me were Randall Kaufman and Craig Hayes. And uh, Randall, uh, we are hopeful we'll get Randall on eventually here. And uh, Craig Hayes, uh, I'm going to reach out to him as well. He runs the Turner Flats Lodge, and I definitely have heard about him. So hopefully if somebody knows Craig out there and want to connect us, uh, Mike, I'm going to be doing that for you and putting together that episode uh, in the near future as fast as I can. So thank you for checking out, checking in with me. If you want to check in and get a chance for a shout out on this episode and also get a chance to get one of your podcast topics or guests on this show, send me an email, Dave at Wet Fly Swing or Wet Fly Swing on social media. All right, where are we heading next? Where are we heading next? Let's take a quick peek and see where we're heading next. All right, all right, all right. Here's we go. Here we go. Here we go. So tomorrow, tomorrow it looks like we are turning right around the corner. And we are staying in the fly tying, uh, fly tying topic uh, category, and we're heading to uh, Idaho for the Eastern Idaho Fly Tying uh, Symposia. I guess this is kind of an event that's been that hasn't been going for a couple of years with COVID, but it's back. It's back, baby. So check that out on Thursday. We're heading to the East Coast to talk a little Euro with Antoine, so that's going to be a great episode. And then next week, we are jumping right into it with the Stillwater giveaway. This is your chance to uh, jump right into a chance to win a big pack, a trip up to British Columbia, and a bunch of products. So there you go. So we have some stuff all over the place, and uh, we're going to keep that rolling as we move ahead. So just want to let you know, I'd love to catch with you on water. We've been uh, connecting with a few people and setting up this Euro school. I'm going to be excited to connect with a few people there. If there's a slot, you can check always wetflyswing.com slash trips. Trips is the easy way to find out what current trip is open. And if there are available slots, you can just enter your email and phone number there and I'll follow up with you right away and let you know. All right. If you get a chance, if I don't see you on the water, please check with me online anytime. Dave at Wetfly Swing. And uh, I hope right now that you are having a good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. And I appreciate you for supporting this podcast. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.